Thank you. I uh, I wish to start by apologizing for not being there, but uh, thanks for arranging this uh, yeah. Zoom webinar. So uh, allowing me to to talk to you. So uh, uh, since uh, there was enough information about me during the introduction, um, I'm just gonna move on to uh, the talk, and the talk will be mainly on uh, fault location in power systems. Uh, so before I start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, the sponsors of this work. I mean, mainly the, the, it was jointly sponsored by uh, Department of Energy and National Science Foundation. And uh, we did the work on this, uh, uh, this uh, four school ERC that we are part of uh, current. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the contributions of students Wang Yufeng and Arthur Morko. Uh, so with that, uh, let me move on to uh, the outline. So I, I, I'd like to, even though probably you all know what the fault location problem is, I'd like to just briefly describe it and uh, and then talk about the, uh, the formulation uh, of that uh, proposed solution. And then I'll talk a bit about the implementation of that solution and some of the issues, and then uh, show some examples uh, using uh, typical power systems under faults, uh, and then summarize the contributions and try to answer if you have any questions after that. So. Um, so the fault location problem is a, is an age old problem. Um, it's not a new problem, and it's uh, uh, essentially uh, boils down to uh, catching uh, and locating uh, short circuits occurring in power systems, and these short circuits occur due to unexpected. Uh, but most of the time natural causes like uh, lightning striking a, a line uh, or uh, a tree branch uh, falling on a, a, a conductor uh, or uh, sometimes vegetation growing and reaching out to the to the height of the overhead lines and uh, touching them uh, things like that, so uh, they cannot be always avoided, uh, and when they happen, uh, they trip uh, the circuit breakers and take out uh, the entire transmission lines uh, out of service, and as a result, uh, you know, they need to be uh, dealt with, located, and repaired, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, the the problem is some of these lines are, uh, as I'm, I'm showing here in this diagram, it's uh, essentially the power system systems can be thought of as a, as a graph uh, where, where the nodes are, the, the substations, and, uh, and the branches are uh, either the transmission lines or the transformers. And uh, some of these lines may be really long, in the order of uh, hundreds of kilometers. Uh, so therefore, if there's a fault, and uh, even if the fault is cleared uh, by the relays, um, it's important to, to know the uh, exact location of the fault so that the crew can, can go and uh, you know, attend, attend the, the, the fault. Uh, and the, the terrain may be rough, and especially in rough uh, weather in the middle of uh, snowstorms and this and that. Um, so uh, so it's, it's, it's important to, to locate the, the fault as, as closely as, as possible. So, uh, so it's actually a two-step uh, process. Uh, the first thing is to, to identify uh, the line which is faulted. Uh, and then once we know that, then uh, we would like to also know exactly where the fault is along that line. So we need to know the distance 
from uh, one of the terminals of the line to the fault point. Uh, now uh, I'm showing on this diagram uh, those circles with the letter P and they represent uh, phaser measurement units. Uh, you are probably familiar with this, but uh, just to clarify, phaser measurement units are um, these devices uh, that uh, sample, uh, use high, high frequency sampling, they sample <coughs> voltages or currents and, uh, and uh, they timestamp these samples using GPS. Uh, so no matter where they are, uh, they are synchronized with respect to each other through the GPS system. And uh, using these samples, they uh, do a, a FFT and uh, produce uh, a phaser uh, representing uh, the voltage uh, at that point where the measurement is taken. And they provide these phaser measurements uh, quite uh, uh, at a high rate, uh, typically any, anywhere from 30 to 60 times a second. Uh, so they can provide these phases uh, quite accurately and uh, in a synchronized fashion. Um, so so uh, the, the systems, power systems are equipped with these PMUs, uh, but uh, not necessarily uh, at all the buses, at all the substations. As shown here, they, they may be uh, located at uh, a certain percentage of the substations in the system. Okay, so, um, so again, the motivation, even though I went through this, um, obviously public safety is one, we need to locate the fault fast. And also we, we wish to minimize the service interruption because anytime you have a fault, uh, some, of, some of the customers may suffer because of that. And also there is a cost associated with the reduced transmission capacity and sometimes associated with that the reduced uh, security margin. Uh, this is related to the stability of the system, either voltage or the angle stability may be reduced the margin for that. So um, as I said, this is a very old problem. Uh, it has been studied uh, in the past. Uh, uh, and by many people. And the, the solutions offered uh, can be sort of categorized uh, under three, uh, three categories. Uh, obviously, I mean, you can probably group them in different ways, but this is one way uh, I look at it. Uh, one is uh, those techniques which use uh, the power frequency. In other words, you filter out uh, the higher frequencies and you, you try to, uh, to capture uh, the 60 Hertz signals. And from there, you having the voltage and the current captured, uh, you try to uh, find the uh, effective impedance uh, looking into the line. And when there's a fault, this impedance certainly becomes uh, much uh, smaller. And based on that, uh, uh, you, you, you try to estimate uh, the location of the fault. Um, uh, th th there is also uh, this category of methods which rely on traveling waves because anytime there's a fault, the fault uh, generates uh, or initiates a traveling wave, a, a signal uh, which travels both ways. Um, and if you have a way of capturing uh, the wave front uh, of this traveling wave uh, and uh, and since these are synchronized uh, sensors capturing it, uh, you can capture the arrival times uh, in a synchronized fashion. And based on that, uh, you can triangulate and uh, try to determine the location of the fault. Uh, this requires uh, high frequency sampling because you need to capture this very fast traveling uh, wave, uh, uh, which means that you, you probably cannot use the conventional uh, instrument transformers like the uh, current transformers and power transformers having cutoffs uh, around you know 5,000 uh, 5 kilohertz range. Uh, so you probably need to use one of those um, uh, you know optical uh, instrument transformers, uh, optical CTs or PTs, 
so that is some additional uh, complication here uh, for uh, implementing these methods. And then there's the, the, the whole group of methods with, which rely on AI and machine learning and so forth. And they, uh, they try to use either, uh, uh, you know, the, the history, the recorded history or uh, simulated, uh, simulated fault scenarios uh, to, to, to train uh, and, uh, and then hopefully get a, a successful prediction uh, when they actually measure the voltage and the current uh, during a fault. Uh, so um, so the, the, the method or the, the approach uh, I, I will be talking about is probably um, uh, can, be, can be classified as, uh, as in, in the first category, but uh, with a different uh, uh, sort of tilt in the, in the sense that we are assuming that the system is not observable. In other words, uh, we don't have enough PMUs or measuring instruments or sensors uh, that will allow us to uh, to capture what's happening at the terminals of the fault of the line uh, by by uh, by these PMUs. So uh, so we assume that the phasor measurement units are installed only at a very small percentage of the system buses, which represent the, the substations. And we also assume that uh, we know the network topology and line models and so forth uh, pre-fault before the fault occurred. So under this assumption, uh, the, the question is, can, can a fault uh, on any line be located and uh, its fault type can be identified? Because we are also interested in uh, identifying what kind of fault it was whether it was a three-phase to ground fault or a face-to-face -face fault, a face-to-face -to, -face to ground fault, single phase to ground fault, and so forth. So, uh, so this is the question uh, we wish to answer. So, um, so we start out uh, to, to formulate this problem. We start out by looking at the pre-fault uh, network, uh, and you know, you just write the network equations, uh, this uh, Edmonton's matrix times the, the, the bus voltages uh, equating to the net injected currents. And uh, here I'm showing uh, just uh, any, uh, any branch, any line connecting buses K and M. And uh, the corresponding rows columns in the admittance matrix are uh, highlighted there. And uh, the, the pre-fault voltage uh, multiplied by that, and that gives you the pre Default uh, net injected current uh, vector. So, <clears throat> so, so then, if we consider um, if you consider a fault along that line, KM line, um, at point F, uh, which is an unknown point, obviously, and uh, consider a fault current, uh, an unknown fault current IF. Uh, uh, that, that, that can be sort of um, incorporated into the network equations by augmenting uh, the, the, the equations by, by one row column, adding this uh, fictitious uh, uh, bus uh, F uh, where, where this unknown fault is occurring. And uh, we have this uh, equation. And here uh, we are also uh, doing a a difference uh, equation instead of just writing the equation after the fault, we are writing the equation in such a way that we subtract the post fault network equations from the pre fault network equations. So, as a result, if you look at the equation uh, here, uh, you will see that we, we are calling this vector now delta v, indicating that this is the difference between uh, the post fault. Uh, values minus the, the pre-fault values uh, at each of those buses. And uh, assuming that this fault uh, occurs all of a sudden, uh, so we approximate uh, uh, the, the changes in the net injected currents at every bus with zero because uh, typically loads and generation, they don't really change that fast uh, instantaneously. The only uh, change we expect, of course, is this uh, fault current, uh, which is the, the, the reason why uh, you know, the, the, 
the system has changed. So uh, given this uh, equation, uh, we can uh, apply uh, a reduction, uh, a Kron reduction, uh, and, uh, and uh, get this equation. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, when we do that, we, we get our original uh, admittance matrix back without any changes. Uh, and, uh, and, and then of course here we have uh, the, the changed uh, values, the difference values in the bus voltages. And on the right-hand side, uh, because of uh, the sparse connections of this uh, fictitious point F to K and M, uh, we will only see changes uh, brought to entries uh, in row uh, K and row M in uh, the, the, the current injection uh, vector. So, uh, so as a result, we have this uh, picture where uh, where the right-hand side uh, current vector is empty completely, uh, other than those two entries corresponding to the terminals of the faulted branch. And, uh, and, and then the voltage solution is uh, uh, essentially the, the changes at each and every bus uh, voltage uh, in the system. Uh, so at this point, um, you, you, you can uh, also, uh, uh, think about it li like this. We, we have uh, uh, the actual system with the faulted uh, uh, line, uh, the, the fault current uh, injection somewhere along the line, unknown point along the line. And the voltages uh, have changed as a result of this fault by uh, delta V, delta VK, delta VM amount at each end, as well as everywhere else in the system. And then uh, we can replace this picture by a picture where there is no fault. So the line is not faulted, but uh, we have uh, these fictitious equivalent injected currents representing uh, exactly the same uh, operating condition uh, created by the fault. So these two are equivalent and we, we tend to uh, now use the bottom equivalent picture uh, for the for the reasons uh, you will see, so um, so not only uh, uh, that uh, we, we we get this uh, uh, nice equation uh, where, where y bus remains uh, y bus remains the same and uh, the, there are only two non zeros on the right hand side vector, uh, but also uh, these values even though we don't know them these are unknown values but if we we know what these values are, that, that those values can actually be used to determine the distance from the two terminals, uh, from terminal M and from terminal K. Uh, you can actually calculate the uh, percentage uh, length uh, to the fault uh, by using these two expressions. And these are uh, straightforward to derive uh, from the Kron reduction uh, process. Uh, so if, if we knew these uh, virtual or um, sort of equivalent injected currents, then uh, we could have easily found the location of the fault using these uh, expressions. So, uh, so, so then the question uh, is, um, how, how, how does it work? Uh, does it really work? Before we, we, we try to formulate a solution, uh, I'd like to show you an example just to, to show you how this thing, um, uh, this thing works. Um, so so uh, th this is a very simple, uh, small example, but uh, it's interesting because uh, this is a, uh, is a distribution system uh, model and it contains uh, not only three phase uh, uh, branches, but they, it also contains two phase, single phase uh, branches. So it's a, mixed uh, three-phase system having uh, some branches three-phase, some branches two-phase, some branches single-phase. And uh, similarly, the loads may be single-phase, three-phase, or two-phase. So it's a mixed system of uh, lines uh, uh, in, in a distribution system. And in this system, we, uh, uh, we simulate uh, a fault along this branch or line section connecting bus two to bus five. And we do it in such a way that uh, the fault occurs exactly one fourth of the line length 
uh, from um, uh, from uh, bus two. So uh, so by doing that, and if we simulate the fault, and we actually uh, we actually check uh, how these virtual or equivalent injections looks like. Uh, and in this case, by the way, the fault is a uh, phase to phase, phase A, phase B to ground fault. So this is the type of fault we are simulating uh, along this line. Uh, so for this case, if you look at the, the, the results, uh, you, you will see that um, uh, we, we see uh, all zeros um, uh, as estimated as the, uh, as the uh, uh, entries in the current vector, except for uh, the two uh, ends. And at the two ends, only the two phases are significant uh, because those are the phases which are faulted. Like phase C uh, doesn't show up uh, as a virtual injection. And not only that, if you look at the ratios here, you see that it's one to three. Uh, indicating that uh, one part is uh, three and the other part is one, which is exactly uh, how we actually uh, calculate based on these injections, the location of the fault, the percentage length uh, starting from one end going to the other. So this is just an example to illustrate uh, or to verify uh, this uh, formulation. Um, and now uh, if uh, obviously, this is a very simple uh, approach. If we had a chance to uh, measure uh, the pre-fault and the post-fault voltages at all buses, that means if we have access to delta V, then it would have been a trivial process. We could have just measured these, multiplied by the admittance matrix, and that would have given us the two non-zero entries in delta I. And from there, we could just move forward and, uh, and, and, and locate the fault. Uh, however, uh, unfortunately, we don't have PMUs uh, at every bus, or we don't have enough PMUs to make the system fully observable so that we have access to those values uh, in the, the voltage vector delta V. So, uh, so what we can do is uh, we can uh, take the inverse of the admittance matrix, uh, which we call Z, Z bus here, and uh, rewrite this equation in the reverse order, and then uh, assume that uh, only a portion of uh, the voltage uh, buses uh, are, uh, uh, have uh, PMUs, so we only have access to a small percentage of these uh, voltage differences uh, measurements, uh, and the rest of them we don't know. Uh, so that will uh, partition the equation like this, and uh, and then we can look at it uh, essentially like this. We are carving out a portion of Z bus based on the available set of uh, voltage measurements, and uh, we are having this equation, uh, this sort of uh, rectangular uh, coefficient matrix times uh, delta I equals delta dr, which is a um, which is a um, uh, an underdetermined uh, set of equations. Uh, so that, uh, that, that gives us uh, uh, this picture. So uh, in, in this picture, obviously uh, we are stuck and uh, we, we, we need to figure out a, a way to solve this equation. And uh, the nice thing is that even though this is an underdetermined set of equation, we already know that uh, the solution is a uh, a sparse uh, vector. There are only a few non-zeros in it, and the majority of it uh, is full of uh, zeros. So we exploit that, um, and uh, obviously uh, this uh, is an old problem. It's nothing new. Uh, it has been looked at uh, earlier. So uh, for, for this kind of uh, uh, undetermined set of equations uh, where you have a smaller number of equations than the, the number of unknowns, uh, but you know that the unknown uh, vector uh, contains only few non-zeros, even though you don't know where they are, which ones are those, uh, you know that uh, there are a few. Um, so, so this kind of uh, sparse uh, uh, problems uh, are uh, dealt with earlier and uh, 
and, and, and interestingly, of course, the, the group who dealt with it and came up with this nice solution is actually from there, from your institution, uh, statistics, uh, Professor Tipshirani and uh, his co-workers, they have uh, worked on this problem and produced uh, some nice tools uh, to, to use for these uh, uh, types of problems. Uh, one of them is uh, it's based on this lasso, the, known as the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. And uh, using that uh, uh, optimization, solving this optimization problem, uh, they, they can actually find a solution to this uh, uh, underdetermined but sparse set of equations. Uh, so, uh, so in our case, uh, the sparse set of equations are given like this. Unfortunately, this is a, uh, a complex uh, phasor equation. ZR uh, is, a, is a complex matrix. These are phasors. These are complex numbers. So we, we split them and turn the equation into a much larger dimension, but real problem like this, uh, the real and imaginary parts of uh, the currents and so forth. The simple uh, conversion uh, and, and, and then apply uh, the lasso uh, approach and, uh, and, and solve it uh, this way. So, um, so uh, it seems like this is a nice uh, solution and that will give us uh, uh, some uh, usable results. Uh, but there are a few uh, caveats. Uh, one of them is uh, that, uh, as you know, I mean, the, the systems, power systems are uh, protected by fast relaying action. There are relays and they uh, respond to fault currents. And uh, by, based on the setting of these relays, uh, they can uh, you know, clear the fault. Uh, depending on how fast they operate, it can take uh, one or two cycles or more, but uh, they don't certainly allow the fault to remain and to reach the post fault steady state uh, value. Uh, and uh, this is precisely what we are using because we, we need the post fault steady state value in order to, to use those um, um, or pre fault and post fault steady state uh, difference equations. Uh, so, therefore, um, we, uh, we, we wanted to, to make sure that we actually have access to those values. And turns out that if you capture the voltage transients, and you can, uh, because the PMUs internally, they have access to high frequency sampling uh, of, of signals. So if you have access to those voltage transients during the initial few cycles, uh, they can be used to predict the post fault steady state voltage phases. Uh, and one way, and probably not the only way, but the one way to do that is, uh, using crony analysis. Uh, so here uh, I'm showing an example of that. So this is the fault uh, duration. And then here the fault is cleared. So it doesn't allow this to continue and settle in a post fault steady state, uh, which would have been like this if you allowed it to settle. And this is precisely what we want uh, to, to use in, in, in the formulation. So therefore, um, uh, what we need is to be able to use uh, this window here uh, when the, the, the fault is still on and there's a transient going on, use that transient data to capture it and uh, to use that uh, with uh, some uh, manipulation using the Prony analysis and estimate uh, the, the steady state, long-term steady state behavior of the signal. And indeed, uh, you can do it. Uh, and here I'm showing one example of that. Here there is the fault uh, and, uh, and the fault is cleared right there. And uh, from then on, if you use the uh, prony analysis and do the prediction, uh, the yellow uh, signal is uh, 100 times uh, magnified version of the prediction error and uh, the blue and the red lines show the estimated and the measured signals uh, which are fairly uh, fairly close 
And then, of course, you can predict uh, in the end the steady state, post fault steady state value uh, based on this prediction. So that's, uh, that's one uh, issue uh, that uh, had to be uh, resolved. And based on that, uh, we have uh, looked at uh, an example here. This is a, uh, an example system with 118 sort of uh, substations modeled, and it's a three phase system. So each and every one of these lines are three phase lines, the loads are three phase, and so forth. And uh, we did test uh, several different uh, uh, scenarios here. Um, for instance, uh, in this scenario, we are looking at a, a three phase to ground fault uh, occurring at 20% uh, of the line uh, along uh, this line connecting bus 50 and 57. And looking at the currents uh, uh, estimated by LASSO, you, you notice that uh, they are not strictly zero. Uh, there are certainly large ones uh, that appear here. Uh, and, uh, and those actually correspond to indeed bus 50 and bus 57 phases ABC as shown here. But in order to, uh, to uh, sort of uh, <clears throat> filter them out, uh, we, we are using a threshold. As you can see, we, we put a threshold here and we sort of throw out anything below that threshold and just consider the ones above um, to, 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 to find these uh, virtual currents. And based on those and based on the expressions I showed earlier using the ratios, uh, we can actually estimate uh, the fault location fairly uh, closely. You know, it's, got, it's supposed to be 20% and 80%. And these are the numbers we get for different phases. Uh, for this case. Uh, you can also do a different kind of fault where there's a fault between two phases, face-to-face -face fault, and it's happening at 5% of the line, uh, length of line 101 to 102. And here, as you can see, since this is a face-to-face -face fault, the number of non-zeros we expect in the current vector are smaller. In this case, only two uh, on each end, 101 and 102. Again, we are using the threshold here. Uh, and, uh, and uh, we get uh, results which are, uh, again, approximate, but uh, close. This is 4.8 instead of 5. This is 3.9 instead of 5. And this is 95.20 instead of 95. And this is 96.10 instead of 95%. Now, uh, we were uh, thinking about um, how to improve this a bit further. And we said, okay, if we are identifying the faulted line based on this lasso algorithm, uh, why uh, put all the burden on lasso? Uh, why not, uh, you know, help it uh, to, uh, to 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 further improve the accuracy of the estimation? So essentially, what we do is once we lock it, once we uh, lock in on the on, on the faulted line, uh, then uh, we know that those are uh, defaulted uh, line corresponding columns in ZR. So you can pull those and create an ordinary least squares problem in this case, because now we have, we know which line is the faulted line. So using this kind of uh, approach by just, uh, you know, pulling the, uh, the columns uh, corresponding to the, to the identified uh, faulted line, uh, we can improve. And indeed, uh, if you look at this case, for instance, uh, the ones that we uh, looked at earlier, uh, in this case, uh, we ran into some uh, uh, non-zeros, which are not supposed to be there by using lasso, uh, even though the rest uh, were correct. Uh, and then do, doing the OLS, uh, we can clean it out and then get uh, these results as shown here. And uh, and 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 then similarly, uh, we can uh, do it for another case uh, shown here between 50 and 57. Again, uh, there was a, uh, an incorrect value appearing here, and we were able to clean it up uh, by using uh, the OL OLS approach here. Uh, so um, I guess with that. Uh, uh, I, uh, 
I would like to conclude uh, uh, this is uh, a way to uh, locate faults uh, if you have a limited number of uh, synchronized voltage phasor measurements in a given power grid. Uh, you can improve uh, this uh, by uh, using some sort of a, a prediction algorithm based on something like Crony uh, to, to take the transient sample recordings and uh, the determining the post-fault steady state uh, values that way, because those are not going to be captured by PMU since uh, the relays are not going to allow you to, to keep the fault that long uh, active and live in the system. Now, finally, once the faulted branch is identified, uh, you can further improve on the accuracy of the estimation by uh, doing a one last uh, you know, ordinary least squares estimation. And that will provide you with uh, better estimates uh, for the fault location. Uh, the, the main uh, advantage uh, of this, of course, will disappear as uh, we have, uh, as we install uh, more and more numbers of PMUs uh, in the system. So this is sort of a uh, intermediate uh, solution until that happens. And on the other hand, uh, if this works quite well, um, uh, then you might uh, save on uh, investing on in extra PMUs if, if you can do the job with fewer PMUs instead of installing uh, a PMU at every bus, then maybe it might be a a good solution to save some uh, money, some funds uh, investing in PMUs. Um, I have included some uh, publications at the bottom here, uh, which are related to the presentation, to presented work. Uh, and, uh, and, and then I have uh, my uh, uh, URL here in case you need to contact me for any further questions other than those uh, you already have now. So uh, so I'm ready to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Any oh, okay, uh, shall I go ahead and start answering the questions from the chat box? Uh, yes. <laughs> Please. Yes, so there is a question. Let me repeat the question. Uh, how well does this method work on identifying and locating high impedance faults? Uh, yeah, so high impedance faults probably will not be handled by this because of, um, uh, of, of their, um, uh, I mean, the, the, the way they, they present themselves uh, they contain a lot of jitter, a lot of high frequency signals. And typically uh, those faults, uh, uh, since they don't produce uh, sufficiently high currents, uh, they may uh, go under the radar in this, uh, in this particular uh, approach because the, the approach uh, sort of relies on, on the fact that uh, the, the fault current is uh, significant and, uh, and, and so are the equivalent uh, currents that, uh, that we use to represent it. So more than likely, it, it will not be able to catch high impedance faults. Okay, so um, there's another uh, question uh, trans uh, related to uh, the distribution system. Uh, so transmission is easy with the amount of data available. Have you smart meter voltage event measurements used? Uh, well, I I think um, uh, we we haven't. We this this these are the the, the results that I'm showing are all uh, simulated results uh, using the systems that uh, we use. Uh, we have not used an actual distribution system for this purpose, but. We have used the, um, the uh, IEEE uh, distribution uh, subcommittee uh, 
system that, that there are a number of systems that the ITTB distribution subcommittee put together as typical distribution systems. Uh, one has 123 buses, three phase. Um, we have uh, used those systems to test this, uh, but not using actual fault data. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so there's another question uh, about uh, how you choose the threshold for less of fault current results. Uh, that was uh, just uh, by trial and error, uh, by looking at, uh, of course, since we are simulating results, we know which, uh, which equivalent currents are supposed to be there. And uh, comparing those values for the equivalent currents and uh, the other currents, uh, we came up with uh, an appropriate threshold uh, for a given system. And it turns out that uh, once for a given system, you set this threshold for different faults, for different scenarios, that threshold pretty much holds true as long as you are using the same system. I guess that may be system dependent, uh, configuration topology dependent, uh, but uh, that was uh, mainly the reason why uh, we wanted to find a, an improvement. And that's the reason why we went to that uh, OLS uh, augmentation, uh, because this threshold uh, may be a, a bit um, uh, sort of subjective, this choice of that threshold. I, I don't see any others. Uh, any other I, I, I have one question. Yes. Uh, yeah. It, in the event of a cycle attack, when someone tries to manipulate a PMU mesh, how can I distinguish it is a cycle attack or a fault at a certain location? Yes. Um, well, yeah, I, I think, um, I, I don't know, actually, we haven't looked at that, but uh, the thing is, um, unless the cyber attack is uh, sort of persistent uh, because it, it should coincide with the fault otherwise. Uh, so it, since there's no way to, 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 find, to, to determine the fault uh, ahead of time, the fault time, uh, this should be a persistent attack to the, uh, to the PMU. And maybe there is a way to, to identify persistent attacks uh, in general. Uh, but no, we haven't looked at what will happen in that case. Okay. Another question I have is, if, if you know the free port topology, uh, what was the minimum number of PMU they that need? Or, or where should they be placed? Is there a placement problem associated with it? Because you are trying to you're trying to identify the thoughts with, with, uh, with the minimal number of PMU measurements. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess uh, this is the PMU uh, placement problem you are referring to. I mean, they, there, are, uh, uh, there are some results uh, uh, in uh, some of the uh, LASSO papers. Uh, showing uh, uh, how to choose uh, the right locations for these sensors so that, uh, for instance, you make each and every uh, branch uh, identifiable uh, because uh, this uh, impedance bus uh, matrix is actually notoriously conditioned and, uh, and in fact, I'm not showing all the details, but we are actually using a QR decomposition. So we are not directly using ZBus, but we are using a QR decomposition uh, of it. So, uh, so there are some, uh, uh, some uh, tools, uh, mathematical tools to, uh, to determine uh, the, the, the locations where you should have those sensors, those PMUs in order for uh, you to, to, to be able to identify faults on each and every branch in the system. Uh, we have done some of it uh, uh, in the first uh, students, Guangyu Fang's uh, thesis. There are some examples of that, 
showing how you can choose locations for PMUs so that you, you do have that guarantee. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, in the power systems area, uh, this is uh, very much uh, topology dependent. So it's, uh, uh, there is no generic way to say like uh, on, you only need a certain percentage of buses to be covered in order for this to happen. For each system, it turns out to be a different number, different location. Okay, thank you. Yeah, any more questions? Okay, guys, thank our speaker one more time.